So this sermon is something I really am excited for, as well as it's been something that's been on my heart for a long time. It's been an interesting week. The beginning of this week started um, Monday, and I just was not feeling good at all. And by the time I ended up in bed that night, I was pretty sick. And an interesting thing happened to me, and I can't explain it, but God just, God, I was up because I really wasn't able to sleep well because of how bad I was feeling that night. But in the midst of that, God was speaking to me all night long. And, it, and I'm not trying to, to minimize this at all because it doesn't, that doesn't happen to me very often. You know, where I talk to God, I pray to God, but for him to actually just really just sit there and pour into me, he did on Monday night because of me preparing myself for what I wanted to share today. And I really needed a confirmation from him to know that this was somewhere he wants me to go because it's a very challenging message, super challenging. And I didn't want to feel like I'm delivering this message to you. This is something I really needed to know that God, God wanted you to hear. And as he did, he spoke to me in a way that was incredible. And he took me through scriptures. He took me through um, Old Testament. He took me through circumcision and sacrifice and the altars and, and the different um, festivals. And, uh, and, and he was just flooding my mind with all these things. And it was incredible. And it was, he, was putting it, he was orchestrating it so beautifully, how it all fit together. And I was just, just awed by it. And I woke up in the morning, and I just was thinking about that all day long. And it come to my, it come to my realization, as I tried to put what he gave me down in words, I couldn't. He did it too well. <laughs> he did it too well. And even the, the mystery behind it sometimes, it made all the sense in the world why he was talking to me. Everything fit together perfectly. And then I'm like, okay. And as I started to put it together and try to put it into words and journal it, I was struggling with it because it's, God is so much higher than us. When he starts to give us supernatural things, he starts to reveal heaven. I can, I can just picture John when, when he gave John that revelation. And then here's John trying to write his revelation to the church. And how much of a struggle that had to be for him to witness something of that magnitude and then have to relate and have it relatable to the church. It's, you know, it goes far beyond what words can sometimes express, and that's kind of how I felt. Now, I do have to confess, I, I should have probably got up in the middle of the night and started writing down as he was giving it to me, but I, I didn't, and I wish I did. So, and I've learned in the past not to, to, to hesitate on something like that. When God gives you something in the middle of the night, write it down because when you don't write that down sometimes, it can, it can like fade a little bit. And it's so fresh and so good. But my sermon today is on true surrender. And that's what I kind of labeled it as for a lack of, of better words. And the church... We hear that word used a lot in the church today, especially in Christianity, how, you know, Christians surrender their life to Jesus and how they give their life to Jesus. We hear it sung in songs all the time. We hear it spoken through sermons. We even hear it in, in, in Christian conversation all the time about surrender and people surrendering their lives. But does our, gra- does our heart really grasp onto that? Does that word, does that word really ring out in our heart? Is it the anthem of our heart to surrender fully to God? And that's the question. Because that's something that's been burning in my heart for a long time. I've seen so many people come to church and then at some point they leave. I see other people that have come to church and they 
you know, they, they come to church, but their lives outside of church waver from what really Christianity is about. They live totally contrary to the word. And there's like this half-heartedness that I feel. And, I, and it's been something that's bothered me for so long, but I wasn't, I wasn't really ever able to really express what was going on in my heart. And don't, don't get me wrong, because this message is a message of love. It's not a message, because this is stuff that I deal with too. My sincerity to the call. How willing am I? We talked about this yesterday in the men's group, about the willingness when God calls us, how willing, how far are you really willing to go for God? And that's a good question. We, we've lost. We've lost some of what the Scripture says about pursuing and being hungry and thirsting for righteousness. In Matthew, Jesus talks about it. He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. But in today's church, we talk about the love of God, and we kind of kind of end there. We just leave that responsibility of what do we do after we realize that God really loves us? What do we do with that? Do we just say, that's kind of, that's good, and then we're just going to keep going on living the way that we live? Or do we really allow God to grab hold of us and change and mold and transform us? I believe that a lot of times, and I've, I, I hear it spoken all the time, about you know, grace versus works. And this is one thing we've been studying in our, our Bible class in the epistles. We've gone through James, we've gone through Jude, we've gone through um, John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and, and, and Peter's. And they're dealing with something within the church, this apostasy that's happening within the church where people are really kind of altering the word of God. And these apostles and disciples are really trying to correct this because they're at their last stages. These are, they're later in life. And they, some of them had died. Apostle Paul had been crucified in Rome. And they want to leave the church uh, a, a letter of accountability. So they're doing this. And we see that there, and they're, and they're encouraging them that, you know, like James, he encourages. Now, James was written earlier, but James encourages, don't be just a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. He's dealing with hypocrisy. And we see that today in church. The American church is good at doing that, just saying, let's water down the message to draw people in. And say, God loves you, okay, that's good. As long as you know that God loves you, you're saved. You can say a half-hearted confession. If you mean it or not mean it, it's okay. As long as Jesus' name is in there, you'll be saved. And that's not quite what the gospel has to say about that. It's not. It's a full surrender. It's making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, laying down your life. And that's difficult to do. But there's a danger when we do that. And I really feel, and this is what I felt God was telling me, is when the church starts to water down the message, and we don't want to make it uncomfortable for people to say, God really, really wants to hold us accountable. He wants us to be that vessel of light. He wants us to live holy because he is holy. When we start to hold that, all of a sudden, now, now it starts to get challenging for the church. But we're not certain if the church is ready to hear that yet. I apologize. If I think the church desires to hear that. I think the church wants to be challenged. Because I think one of three things happen. The first, what you're drawing into your church is people that want to feel good, they want to feel like they have eternal salvation, but they don't want God in their lives at all. So as long as you can make them feel good, eh, we'll keep coming. This is okay. There's no uncomfortableness to that. The second is, and this is where I think sometimes this happens, and, I, and I've dealt with this, is we get to the point 
where if God really doesn't care about us really striving for holiness, well, what's the point of us really striving for holiness? If you don't care, why should I care? And that's not the case. He absolutely cares. He's wanting to transform our lives. He's, he's, he's not only saying, this is a good thing. He says, you must. You must. This is critical. You must allow me to enter into your heart and transform you. That's the message of salvation. I, I think of it as an example like this, you know, sports related because sports are something that I'm very acquainted with. But think of a baseball team. If they went on, they just joined, a bunch of kids joined the baseball team. And the, and the baseball coach really was really lethargic about it. He's like, oh, you guys want to come to practice or not come to practice? It's okay. If you're a practice, you don't really have to try really hard. Well, after a while, that team's just going to not care, right? Well, the same happens in church. Jesus is our general. He's our coach. He's our Lord and Savior. He's the one that we look to for instruction. And if we're saying, well, Jesus loves you and he doesn't really care, you know, how you live your life, eventually the church is just going to say, well, I guess it doesn't matter. But it does. And the third, the third thing that happens within the church when we, when we start to not challenge and pursue righteousness the way that God wants us to, is it leaves his people confused. And I've been there. You know, as soon as I start to say, well, I don't, you know, the Bible says a lot of things here. Jesus said a lot of things in the gospel. And I'm like, you know, you really want, you really got, you really got to surrender. You really want to give your life fully. You know, pick up your cross. And people are, whoa, now you're talking works. Let's not go on to works. That's not the point. The point is laying our lives down and allowing God to transform us. And I'm, in Luke, it says, and I'm going to read you this. Luke 6, 46 says, it's the parable of two foundations. It says, but why do you call me Lord? That's Jesus' words right here. Why do you call me Lord and not do the things which I say? That's some pretty strong words. He says, whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I will show whom he is like. He is like a man digging a house or building a house who digs deep and lays a foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house, and it could not shake it, for its foundation was on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the streams beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and it was ruined. And the house was lost. The house represents our life. Obviously, we know the foundation, that rock foundation, is Christ. Christ says, work, work hard for righteousness. Work hard for holiness. Search me. Don't give up. That's what we're to do. So we build. Sure, it can be challenging and difficult at times. And it almost seem impossible. But that's where God loves to work. He loves to work in the impossibilities. He absolutely loves to work in the impossibilities. He calls us to step out on uncharted shores, to rest fully on him, so that when we know that we don't have the strength to go on, we can look to him, and he will give us that strength. He will give us that wisdom, and he will meet whatever needs that we have to face the challenges that are laid before us. 
that's where we fully rely on him. What he's calling us to do is so supernatural in, in his gospel about loving our neighbors, loving our enemies, you know, pursuing righteousness, keeping his commandments. All these things are very, very difficult to do. And in the natural, they're impossible to do. That's why he says, you need me. He's designed it that way. He doesn't want us to be able to do it on our own. He designed it so that we have to depend fully upon him to be able to come through this. And the other thing I really think is God has created us with a passion and curiosity for challenges. I think the humankind loves challenges. If that isn't so, why do we spend so much time looking for a good story or watching a good show where there's some sort of insurmountable challenge that a person faces and overcomes? Think about the tens of thousands of books and shows and movies that base their entire plot around this one thing. People love to see a challenge that is bigger than that person, and then somehow they, they find a way to overcome. God's created us that way. Now think, for, think about this for one moment. If that is true, I believe that God has big plans for us. I really do. Huge plans for us. The Bible calls believers overcomers. And if we're overcomers, that means we have to overcome something, some sort of challenge, some, something in life we have to overcome, if not lots of things. What, what's one of the things that we overcome? The evil one, Satan himself. He's, our, he's the adversary fighting against us. I wanted you to think for a minute. This is just kind of something fun. But think, think about, like, think about some movies. Think about, like, the, 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 the devious, most evil villain that you can come up with in your head right now. There's been lots of them. I was just kind of brainstorming. I see some smiles. Think of, like, Godzilla. I think of, uh, I thought of, uh, you know, if you think of Wizard of Oz with the Wicked Witch of the West. You think of um, King Kong or more, I, th I wanted to go back into some of the older ones like the Blob or Cyclops. <laughs> Remember them? Okay, I didn't, I don't know them too, too, too closely, but uh, I was just kind of just Googling it, evil villains. But, I, you know, there was one that I kind of came up with, I remember. Do you remember the movie Ghostbusters? You remember Ghostbusters? Do you remember them dog gargoyles that were in that movie that came to life and they chased them? Them things scared me when I was a kid. <laughs> I was scared. Them things were nasty. You know? You think of Star Wars nowadays and you see Dark Vader or the Sith or... Um, um, older movies like The Terminator, Predator. There's so many different movies that have these, these, these villains that are just set to destroy. And these are, this is an impressive list. It's a really, really an impressive list. But we face an adversary that's even worse than them. He would make them look like child's play. He would ab absolutely make them look like child's play. Satan laughs over these things. These are cartoonish to him. But that's what we are intended to overcome. John talks about it. says, um, in 1 John it says, he's talking to his, his children. He says, you have overcome the evil one, dear child. And he repeats that a couple different times. Fortifying that in the reader's mind, you are designed to overcome the evil one. God has equipped you to overcome the evil one. And that's amazing. Think about that. It's amazing. 
And I just want to, I don't want to get onto this too much, but the weapon that Satan uses against us is sin. That's his weapon. That's what separated Adam and Eve from God in the garden. He loves to use it, and he will dress that thing up in all sorts of shapes and forms for us to partake of. But it's not meant for us. It's not meant for our blessing. So I just... I've read in books and I've read in some of the old uh, preachers about how passionate they were about how, how sin is so devastating to one's life. And I was thinking about it. So why are we so passive about sin as Christians? We really, you know, it's kind of like, it's not a big deal. But it is a big deal. And sin isn't. It isn't just to harm you. It's to harm your loved ones, too. When somebody sins, it doesn't just affect the person. It affects everybody around them. I see it so often, and it crushes my heart. It really does. How it devastates people's children, marriages, families. We have to come against this as a church. We have to stand and say no more. We want to be passionate for the things that God are passionate for. We want to love God. And we want to love the things that he has for us. And when we do that, it draws attention to his, to his people the world will start to look at us differently and say, why are they living that way? Why are they so different than the rest of the world? How can they go through them situations and, and seem unaffected? We're called to be witnesses for his kingdom. People will start to look at our stories and say, that is incredible, and start to desire what we have in our lives. That's what grows the church. It's not going out there and telling people Jesus loves you, which that's part of it. But it's living that way, believing that so much that it ratifies our lives. Hungering for the word of God. When we hunger for the word, it changes us inside. There was a neat story about Zach Etz. He's the uh, he's the uh, wide re or the tight end for um, the Eagles. We talked about it in men's group uh, yesterday. He's a Christian, and he gave his story after the Super Bowl. And they were kind of asking him, or actually maybe it was just before the Super Bowl, they were giving him an interview about how he came to Christ. And he said, "Well, you know, I kind of knew God when I was a kid, but I I didn't have Him in my heart." And what happened is some of his teammates that were strong believers in Christ, winning or losing, once they got back in the locker room, there was a, there was a peace and a joy about them that he started to really, God started to draw his attention to. And he's like, man, when I would lose, I'd be so much down in the pits for days. He goes, I'd be so disappointed. But they were always level and, and, and seemed just like encouraging their, their, their teammates and saying, you know, it's okay, guys. You know, you know, we'll get them next time. And, you know, it really doesn't matter because we're, you know, we're here for other purposes than just winning football games anyway. And they preach the gospel. And after a while, his heart became interested in that thing that they had. And that's the same that we're supposed to do. When we're in our workplace and things seem to be going awfully bad and really have no reason to have any joy within us. And people notice that. And it starts to make them desire what we have. Just like Zach started to desire what his teammates have, and he gave his heart to Christ. That's our story. That's when 
the fruits start falling off our tree, the fruits of righteousness that God calls us to. He says that we will be known by our fruit. So if we just kind of quietly recognize Jesus in some sort of intellectual, I know that Jesus is God, and, but I don't really want to change my life for him, there's not much fruit there at all. But when we start to say, I'm going to love my neighbor, I'm going to love other people, I'm going to love God and I'm going to share that love, I'm going to give until it hurts, that changes that changes the way people look at you. What do our victories and triumphs look like? Now, as we start to live this way, what do our victories and triumphs start to look like? They look like love. We love God. We love others like God, uh, Christ has loved us. John 15 talks about <laughs> love one another as I have loved you. Satan hates that. He hates when his child, or God's children start to love one another. That's the church I see this church becoming. Church so full of love. There's no room for nothing else. 1 Corinthians 13 isn't just a Bible or a, a Bible scripture on marriage. It's the love chapter. That's the way we are intended to live life moment by moment and day by day. That's our anthem. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not boast. Keeps no record of wrong goes on and on and on and on. That's our anthem. That's what draws people to Christ. And that's how we need to live. Because that's what brings glory to him. That's what he's calling us to do. People sometimes will say, well, well, that's easy. I love, I love. I love my kids. I love my car. I love my friends, my parents, my pets. I love my puppy. So I got, I got Jesus in me. I got his love. Do you love others as yourself? Because Jesus says that's heavenly love. That's heavenly love. So if we do love all them things, and that's good. I'm not saying that's bad. But Jesus even starts to challenge the heart even more. He's, and he starts to say, you know, how about love your enemies? So do we love our in-laws? Do we love our outlaws? <laughs> Here's a good one. Do we love those who have hurt us in the past? It's difficult. It's actually impossible without God. How about do we love those that are hurting us now? Or even Jesus says, love those who persecute you. For my name's sake. And great will be your inheritance in heaven. There's a blessing We're tied to that. He's calling us to that. He's calling us to a greater calling than ourselves now. He's calling us to be led by his spirit. Hmm. This is where we're getting somewhere. This is the love of God. This is the love we are to live by. This is that heavenly love that I just spoke about. This is when we see God descend on earth. We just repeated the prayer this morning. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know, but it talks about his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're to bring his will to earth. And we are the tools that he uses to bring his will on earth. He uses us. He wants us to be part of this. 
And it's an amazing, and it's a privilege to be part of that. That's what we talked about when I preached, I don't know, a couple months ago about being uh, sons and daughters. Sons and daughters of God. If we're sons and daughters of God, then that's what we're here to do. We're supposed to bring his kingdom, his ways with us. We're foreigners of this land. It actually says that the love of the world is hatred towards God. That's challenging. That's super challenging. So, as we see this love descend upon the earth, this love that never envies, because we are full. How can somebody envy for something when we're full and we're not in need? That's the awesomeness of Christianity. God is filling us. We don't need the world to fill us. God is filling us. The love that is not self-seeking because we found the joy of giving. The love that rejoices in truth because we know its power. We know the power of truth. And we also know its name. And that name is found in Jesus. And the, and the love that keeps no record of wrong. It's tough to do, but that's the love that God has for us. And he calls us to that same type of love. Because we love because he has first forgiven us. Because he's first loved us. We forgive because he has forgiven us. So how are we doing, church? How are we doing? You know what? You're in good company because I got a lot of work ahead of me. A lot of work ahead of me. But I love a challenge. I hope you guys love a challenge too. This isn't a condemning message. This is a message of hope. When we start to live this way, the blessings of God will fall upon us. And I'm excited about that. I've seen it already in my life. It just takes a willing heart. That's all it takes. Just a willing heart. God doesn't overcomplicate it. He just wants you to be willing. And to trust him. And he'll do the rest. I believe one of the reasons that we haven't been doing so good, and I'm not saying us, I'm saying as a church in general within all around us. So we need to, to encourage one another more. We need to challenge one another more, to hold each other accountable in a loving way, not in a condemning way, but in a loving way, to come beside one another and help one another. Much will get accomplished that way. The other thing that I think we need to not understand a little bit is the word grace. I think grace has been so abused that it has really morphed into something that God has really not intended for it to take shape into. Grace isn't just Saying, having God's forgiveness, and then he's saying, well, okay, I've forgiven you. I'll kind of turn my back on your life from this point forward. You know, you're, you're forgiven this point forward going on. It's not, that's not grace. grace. Grace is unmerited favor of God. Unmerited favor of God. But it's him empowering us. Grace is the empowerment of God in our lives to be able to do these things, to be able to love, to be able to obey. And not obey as obligated children, but obey because we are children that love him. We are children that love what he has to say. He changes that. He transforms that. I know when I thought of Christianity... Before I came to Christ, I thought, oh, man, there's too many do's and don'ts. I don't want that. I got enough don'ts in my life you don't need to look at right now. 
and I don't want to contend with them. But when, when God really grabbed hold of my heart, when I really started to trust him and believe that he loved me, he started to make them don'ts, wants. It wasn't that I wasn't supposed to do it. I wanted to do it. I wanted to honor him in my life because I love him. That's grace. He transforms us into a child of love. And we are passionate for the things that he wants in our life. I'm going to end there, I think. But genuine salvation is a transformation. It produces a change. If we come to Jesus and we look the same after we came to Jesus as we did before, something's wrong. But if there's a change, because salvation produces obedience because we love him and because we want to be obedient. And I am so grateful that he has grabbed hold of my heart and he's, and he's working that way. There's still things in my life that I need to attend to. And he's gracious and kind and he's working in them ways, but he just needs us to be willing. We don't have to overcomplicate it.